so here in this question they're saying the enthalpy of neutralization of a weak monoprotic acid ha is one molar solution with a strong base is minus 55.95 kilojoule per mole okay if the unionized acid requires 1.5 kilojoule per mole heat for its complete ionization and the enthalpy of neutralization of the strong monobasic acid uh, with a strong monoacidic base is minus 57.3 kilojoule per mole what is the percent, uh, percentage ionization of the weak acid in the molar solution okay and your options are given to you as such so basically this looks like a long question it's a very simple idea right so basically they're telling you that in the case of strong acid strong base neutralization so basically strong acid plus strong base gives you salt plus water for that neutralization this is your delta h uh, delta h okay they, they have given you a delta h for weak acid strong base reaction okay that is minus 55.95 kilojoule per mole right and they are telling you that the unionized acid will require 1.4 kilojoule per mole okay great so from here you need to find out percentage ionization so how will you do this basically you need to know that delta h of a uh, reaction is equal to delta h ionization delta h ionization plus delta h of strong acid strong base right that is okay so that's basically your heat of neutralization of ideal condition that's your strong acid strong base complete uh, reaction of h plus and oh minus okay so you have to find out this value okay two other values are given to you so let's see so what is given to you minus 55.95 is the delta h of the reaction okay kilojoule per mole basically we're dealing with uh, one molar solution of everything so we don't have to worry about per mole okay this is sorted so this is equal to delta h ionization delta h ionization plus what is your delta h of ideal condition you have minus 57.3 minus 57.3 correct so now what do you get to subtract so you get delta h ionization is equal to is equal to what do you get uh so you have 57 minus 56 so you have 1.3 1.35 okay so you have minus 1.35 but i think you should only uh care about the magnitude because here also they have only given you magnitude 1.4 kilojoules so here you have delta h of given case divided by delta h of ideal case right so what is this it is 1.35 by 1.4 okay multiplied by 100 okay so 1.4 is for what is for zero percent ionization right is for unionized acid so basically now when you find out what do you get you get 1.35 by 1.4 so this is uh this is definitely going to be greater than 95 percent okay for for convenience i'm just writing 95 percent right because i don't want to go through with the entire calculation now this is 95 percent unionized acid why because your denominator is talking about one mole of unionized acid so which means which means percentage ionization percentage ionization is going to be 100 minus 95 okay so here mind you i have not calculated i am just eyeballing the value okay and i'm getting five percent but i am open to anything less than five percent as long as it is closer to this value okay i have not calculated i'm simply eyeballing the value so let's see what do i have that is close to five percent okay i have option b which is 3.57 percent option a is 1.5 so that is very less okay so if you are if you're still confused what you could do is you could write percentage ionization percentage ionization is equal to 1.4 minus 1.35 divided by 1.4 into 100 okay so basically you have 0 0.05 divided by 1.4 my bad into 100 correct so that's 5 into 10 to the power of minus 2 into 10 to the power 2 divided by 1.4 okay now this is nothing but 5 by 1.5 something like that so basically 4.5 plus 
pi by 1.5. So that's 3. Okay, that's 3. And this will be around, what do you get? Around 0.3. So 3.3% 3 .3 is what I'm looking at. Roughly. And you can see why I took around 5% and why option B is the closest, right? So option C, 35.7 is very far. Option D, 10% is also pretty far. Right answer here is going to be option B, 3.57%. Alright, so in this question, which basically we have from the chapter thermodynamics, they're saying that oxygen gas weighing 64 grams is expanded from 1 atm to 0.1 atm at 30 degrees Celsius. Calculate entropy change assuming the gas to be ideal. Okay, so very first thing is you need to calculate entropy change that is delta S. So this is an isothermal expansion. How do I know? Because they are giving me only one temperature value which means this is going to be an isothermal expansion. Right? So how do you calculate delta S? You can write 2.303 NR log of P initial by P final. Correct? Your P initial is 1 atm, P final is 0.1 atm. Okay, R you know in terms, you are required to write R in terms of joules because your options require you to write it in terms of joules. So R we can write it as 8.314. N is going to be how many, gra uh, see, how many moles? You have 64 grams of oxygen gas. So you have 64 divided by 32, which means you have 2 moles of oxygen gas. So this is 2.303 into 2 into 25 by 3 multiplied by log of log of 1 by 0.1. Log of 1 by 0.1 is going to be what? Log of 10. Log of 10 is going to be what? 1. So this thing becomes 2.303 into 4 into 25 divided by 3 into log of 1. Right? Great. So now what can we do? Let's quickly multiply and find out the answers. You have 2.303 uh, multiplied by uh, 4. Sorry, not... It's going to be 2, right? Okay. So that means this is 4.606 divided by 3 into 25. This is log 10 into 1. And now you can cancel this out. I can approximate 4.606 to 4.5. Why am I doing that? Because I want to write this as 1.5 when I cancel it with 3. Okay, so you have 25 into 1.5, that's nothing but 25 plus 12.5, so that is 37.5 Joule Kelvin inverse, right? And where do you see that? 37.5? Nowhere. But what is the closest that you can get? 38.29. And do you understand why we got 37.5 instead of 38.29? Because of this step, right? Because here I made an approximation and I took it as 4.5 instead of 4.606. So that is why I have a slight discrepancy in my answer. But still, I think it's perfectly okay to say that option B, 38.29, is the right answer to this question. So here they're saying, which of the following expressions regarding entropy is correct? Okay, so when we write down the uh, mathematical expression for entropy, okay, entropy change rather, in a given system, what do we write? We write delta S. Delta S is how we represent change in entropy. So delta S of the system is nothing but your Q reversible upon T. This is what we write. Agree? Okay. So this is the one thing we know for sure. Okay. And then we'll see, you know, what else they are talking about in the options. And as we move along, we'll figure things out. So let's see. So option A is saying delta, delta S of system is equal to Q reversible by T, where Q is the heat energy of the system. Definitely true. The statement is true. We I mean, I just mentioned that the statement is true. Then we have option B, delta S of system is equal to delta S of uh, delta S total plus delta S of surroundings. And you can see option D is suggesting delta S total is equal to delta S system plus delta S surrounding. Now, both of these sound very similar, but there is a massive difference. Okay, what do we know? We know the delta S total or delta S of the universe is equal to delta S of the system plus delta S of the surroundings, right? That is, surrounding is nothing but universe minus system. That is how we define surrounding in thermodynamics, right? So, surroundings. Okay, this is the correct expression. So, now let's see. Option B is saying delta S system is equal to delta S total plus delta S surrounding. This is false. This makes it true, right? 
and then option C is saying delta S is equal to S final minus S initial. Definitely true, right? As with anything that we talk about, like for instance, change in enthalpy, change in Gibbs free energy, anything is going to be final value minus initial value. This is how we calculate the delta of things. This is also true, right? Which means there's just one false statement or one false expression, which is option B. So option B is going to be the right answer to this question. Okay, so here you have a given reaction which is N2 plus 3H2 is in equilibrium with 2NH3. This is honestly one of, you know, the most scoring chapters that you have in chemistry. Also a very, very important chapter in terms of building your fundamental concepts for chapters like ionic equilibrium, which in turn leads to chapters like electrochemistry. So this is a very important chapter to be very honest. Okay, so here they're saying what would most likely happen if there is a decrease in volume of container in which the reaction occurs. Okay, so basically they are saying that you are reducing volume and reducing volume is basically having the same effect as increasing of pressure, right? Okay, so when you increase pressure, what happens to equilibrium? When you increase the pressure, equilibrium will shift in a direction where your number of gaseous moles is lower, correct? Okay, so your number of gaseous moles is lower. That means you have to first calculate where you have a lower number of gaseous moles. On the reactant side, you have 1 plus 3, 4. On the product side, you have 2. Correct? So as you increase the pressure, your equilibrium is going to shift in the forward direction or towards the products. Okay? So product is nothing but ammonia. So you will have more of ammonia formed. So that means option C, more NH3 would form is going to be the right answer to this question. Okay, so here they're saying that in the reaction, HCO3 minus plus H2O gives you CO3 2 minus plus H3O plus. Okay, H3O minus is the conjugate acid of which Bronsted base, right? Okay, so first of all, what is a Bronsted base? What is this Bronsted? See, you have the Bronsted-Lowry theory of acids and bases. Okay, so a Bronsted base is basically any uh, compound, ion, species that acts as a base according to the Bronsted-Lowry theory. Fine. What are the conditions for any species to act as a Bronsted base? Let's see. So any uh, acid that you have, right? Let's say you have any acid HA. This should be able to release proton H plus and A minus. Okay, so this is your acid. This is your proton and this is your conjugate base. I'm just brushing through this because we've already done this in the previous chapter. I'm just revising the concepts for you. Okay, what is an acid? Any species that is capable of releasing the proton is acid. Consequently, what is a base? A base is a species which is capable of absorbing the proton or which is capable of accepting a proton. That is called your base according to Bronsted-Lowry theory of acids and bases. Now, here I have mentioned something called a C dot base. What is that? Conjugate base. What does it mean? If you have a certain acid from which you are removing one proton, be careful, only one proton, then what you get after removing the proton is called the conjugate base of that particular acid. So, here if I have to phrase it, uh, the conjugate base of HA is A minus right? You can look at it from the backward. This will be a base, which means this will be the conjugate acid. So, the conjugate acid, okay, conjugate acid of A minus is HA. Understood? Cool. Now, let's, uh, you know, apply this concept to this question. HCO3 minus is the conjugate acid of which Bronsted base? So, basically, they are asking you for the conjugate base of HCO3 minus. So HCO3 minus bicarbonate ion should be able to release one proton and whatever is left, let's write that down. That will be your, um, the Bronsted base, that is your conjugate base that they are talking about. So here you will have CO3, 2 minus carbonate ion, correct? So this is your acid, which means this will be your conjugate base. Or when I look at it from the backwards, I can see that this is the base, which means this is going to be your conjugate acid, right? Okay, great. So, what is the answer? Carbonate ion and that is here in option C. So, option C, carbonate CO3 2 minus is going to be the right answer to this question.